Uh, thank you for joining us for Talking Hemophilia A, Integrating Novel Treatments and Enhancing Patient Outcomes. During this segment, we will be discussing the emerging approaches for hemophilia A. I am uh, Dr. Guy Young, the Director of the Hemostasis and Thrombosis Center at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Jonathan Roberts and Mindy Simpson. I'm going to start by presenting a case. Um, this is a, an 18-year-old who um, had been on factor prophylaxis basically his whole life, um, different products as he was getting from one year to the next as different products became available. Um, and uh, But ultimately, when he became responsible for his own factor infusions at the age of 15, adherence started to become a problem, as I'm sure you've experienced that yourselves. Um, so while we tried to work on his adherence, um, it, it just, it was really quite challenging. And so then emicizumab became available. And um, I'll refer you to the previous um, two uh, case discussions in this same series where we discuss emicizumab at length. Um, to make a long story short, we put him on emicizumab. And he was more adherent, though I will say not perfectly adherent. But this is a really active uh, young man. He plays sports uh, multiple times a week. He goes to the gym. And he was still experiencing bleeds while on emicizumab, even when we know he was being adherent. Uh, and so it raised this question for us about, you know, what other options, you know, might there be for him in the future or currently, at least in clinical trials? And I want to discuss with my colleagues uh, the variety of different options and see which one they might think would be effective. So again, we have an 18-year-old young man, generally healthy joints, really active, um, not adherent with the factor, and he's not really interested in certainly frequent IV infusions, um, but who is needing something that is going to go maybe above and beyond what emicizumab was able to do for him. So with that in mind, what, what options are coming uh, to the future of hemophilia care? So there is a novel replacement therapy, a novel factor rate replacement therapy that has been studied, has gone through phase three trials. Uh, data has been presented and actually has been published in the New England, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine very recently, and that's FNS Octocog Alpha. This is a modified factor eight concentrate, modified even more so than the uh, extended half-life factor eights that you may be familiar with. And essentially, it has a much longer half-life. And patients on the trial, and these were adolescent and adult patients who are on the trial, basically lived with a factor eight level of uh, about 70 to 80 percent with a trough of around 15 percent. And that's with a once-weekly intravenous infusion. So just a once-a-week infusion and essentially living with those levels, spending about half the week in the non-hemophilia range. Then the other options uh, that are coming down, the pike are non-replacement therapies. We break them into two categories, essentially, rebalancing agents that rebalance hemostasis, in a sense, um, not adding uh, a factor product or a factor-like product, but inhibiting an inhibitor of coagulation. And there are a number of these. One is an inhibitor of antithrombin called pituceran. Um, currently, this is in phase three trials, and it is a subcutaneous infusion that would be initiated as once every other month uh, with the potential for increasing it to once a month, depending on uh, antithrombin levels. There are two tissue factor pathway inhibitor inhibitors, so anti-TFPI molecules, concizumab, marstasumab. Uh, both are also in phase three. Concizumab has shared some of their early phase three data. <clears throat> um, concizumab is a daily subcutaneous injection. Marstasumab is a weekly subcutaneous injection. Uh, concizumab does come with a, a neat little uh, pen, which is a dosing pen, and the volume of infusion is quite low. So even though it's daily, um, it's certainly not a, a huge burden in terms of how to do each individual infusion. And then the other option would be something like gene therapy. We've heard certainly over the last few years about several factor eight gene therapies that are being developed. Um, Valoctocogene roxaparvovec, which is the one furthest along, um, giroctocogene fitilparvovec, uh, and lastly, duraloctocogene samoparvovec. So these are all in uh, phase 
three clinical trials, uh, some further along uh, than others. Uh, importantly, the gene therapies have only been studied in patients 18 years of age mm -hmm. or older. Uh, I will just say before I turn the discussion over uh, to me and my colleagues together, is that you know all of these have advantages and disadvantages. And depending on the type of patient you're dealing with, depending on whether they have a history of an inhibitor or not, whether they're an adult or not, um, whether they are okay with IV infusions or not, um, whether they have a high appetite for uh, uh, risk, or I should say high appetite, but whether they're risk averse or not, uh, if they have a history of thrombosis or potential risk factors for thrombosis, all of these things come into play when you have a, a menu of options, some of which uh, may be safer from the standpoint of thrombosis than others, some of which may be more efficacious uh, than others, and some of which have different levels of the treatment burden, how much treatment you need to do. So with that in mind, uh, maybe I'll start by asking uh, uh, Mindy, um, Here's an 18-year-old active young man, not really doing his adherence, uh, not really adhering with his factor eight that we had him on, um, emicizumab, not quite controlling all the bleeds that he wants to have controlled for his activities. Uh, where would you potentially go uh, with this patient with those uh, options we discussed? Yeah, I think it's a really great case to, to highlight the the idea that there are options is really kind of you know what it is and so for the teenagers young adults i think first comes to a conversation with them and what their goals are and what they're looking to do um you know because in all fairness what he's on isn't probably the right choice because he's still bleeding right so we need to do something more um or different um you know i am a huge fan of the idea of maintaining higher factor eight levels for our athletes. Um, I have generally had a, a lot of conversations with my teenagers and young adults that are very active in, ath in athletics that um, you probably need those better factor eight levels, peak levels at times to really maintain the competitive athlete type um, of protection. And so, you know, things like the FNS alpha that's coming that really would allow infrequent IV infusions with, um, you know, much more of the week in that normal factor eight range, um, I think could potentially be a great option. Um, but if they're not going to take it, it's not going to work. And so, you know, if IV is going to be the barrier, then really talking about some of these other these other therapies. So, you know, the the novel non-replacement, the rebalancing type therapies, um, you know, the, it comes with a conversation about the the potential thrombosis side of things and um, and potentially how you treat bleeds <laughs> is different um, on some of these therapies. And it's it does change kind of that. But the, maybe the sub-Q option could be a really great option um, in the short term. But long term, I'm looking at an 18-year-old that, you know, I would have the conversations about gene therapy and is this something they would even consider? And, you know, what are the you, the pluses and minuses of gene therapy of, you know, are they compliant in coming to clinics? Because this was those types of therapies need really good follow-up early on, um, you know, and the idea of, you know, is it a one and done? It's not a cure, um, I think is, you know, a lot of what we're talking about now. So so really, you know, I would I would really advocate for a conversation about goals. What are their goals? What is their life going to look like? Are they going to be moving away for college and, you know, really changing um, their environment too? So. Um, this is a patient that really probably needs a, a conversation about this whole shared decision making and individualizing their options for them. Thanks, thanks, Mindy. <clears throat> Jonathan, if I can ask you just to just to focus a little bit on the gene therapy discussion. Um, you know, Mindy alluded to you know being non-adherent, non-compliant with with factor therapy. Um, what are your thoughts? I mean, with gene therapy, we know it's a single infusion, uh, but there is obviously some work to do after that. How do you view a patient who may have been non adherent for this IV therapies um, as a candidate for gene therapy? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, I think it, it's really to try to drill down to why are they non adherent? Is it because they really are having trouble with the process of doing intravenous infusions, or is it because they don't want to think about their hemophilia and they just want to go live life? 
and it's 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 cumbersome for them to do an infusion. Um, so I would talk a lot about that. But then also, you know, um, I think as uh, as Mindy also mentioned, with getting gene therapy, there will be some commitment up front to some regular monitoring, and um, you know, may need some immunosuppressive therapy, and certainly them knowing that this is not necessarily a long term cure. But if this is a season in their life where they think that they want higher factor levels, maybe it will do a little bit better than the current emicizumab that they're on. I think as long as they have, you know, a, a, a realistic and detailed discussion of, you know, maybe committing to, yeah, I'll do some earlier, uh, you know, upfront monitoring, more frequent monitoring, and and get them to really understand the need of a long-term relationship and how to recognize bleeds if you know their levels do start to fall with one of the the these first generation products um then then i then i think gene therapy may be an okay thing you know for them to do it's just got to be a very nuanced discussion of what their expectations are um certainly of all the options that would allow them to not really need to do any type of regular you know, therapy uh, of a daily, you know, weekly or monthly. Um, but but there would be some of the other monitoring, um, as we know, um, up front. And then really realistic expectations of how much of a response are they going to get and how durable is it going to be? Um, so I think all of those are important conversations um, to have. I think like Mindy, I also, you know, if IV access is not an issue, and this is an athlete that we want to have higher factor levels. Um, you know, uh, FNS Octacog obviously would be uh, a potential choice for uh, uh, actual once weekly uh, therapy, or or even if you're able to tailor it to where you would just maintain normal hemostasis, depending on how active the patient really was going to be. But if it was more of a, you know, they don't mind therapy and they just want less of a treatment interval then potentially something like pituserin with once monthly uh, uh, dosing or less frequently. I think, you know, some of the, what we're learning from the phase three data and how the thrombosis mitigation strategies are being looked at um, are, are interesting. And I think it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, obviously having a causing an antithrombin deficiency being something that can be potentially very thrombogenic and having mitigation strategies if there's maybe you know too much antithrombin knockdown um, are things that are being investigated currently um, but that that of all the options if if they didn't want to go through gene therapy but have some sort of treatment option with maybe the the least frequent interval and, and also the question would be how is that going to be comparable to the current you know, emicizumab that they're already on, and would that offer any other bleed protection? I think that remains yet to be seen. Um, you know, doing a daily uh, infusion, uh, so even if it's subcutaneous, uh, may not be, you know, the, the best option for a patient that's not adherent to therapy. But that being said, if it's very simple, and it's very short period of time, and it's non-painful, which I've heard for some of the uh, patients that have investigated the, like concizumab, for instance, um, <laughs> excuse me, that may be, that may may be an option for them as well. So uh, again, I think the, um, the the great thing about the current era and some of these therapeutics is there's lots of room for nuanced discussions of how to meet this individual patient's goals. Um, and and the good thing is, is that, you know, you're able to change course and maybe try something else if it's not, you know, meeting uh, the, their particular treatment goals. Um, even if someone gets gene therapy and they start would start to lose expression over time, there's many good options to fall back on, right? And uh, I know patients that have quote unquote failed gene therapy with the first iteration um, that there's even investigations looking at what to do with those patients. Are there other potentially next next generation therapeutic options or strategies um, to with a different product are are may, maybe on the horizon uh, in the years to come. All right, thank you for that. And uh, I'll just uh, make a couple comments uh, before we have our closing, which is that, yeah, I would not equate non-adherence with IV factor therapy that has to be given repeatedly with the fact that that patient wouldn't be a good gene therapy candidate. I, I think following up on clinic visits and getting labs done after a treatment like that is really a different situation than you know, needing IV therapy that, you know, as, as a young man, you're looking at it in the future thinking there's nothing else ever, and I'm going to have to do this IV forever, which is really kind of daunting. 
And then as far as the other drugs are concerned, I would just say that, you know, having a, a wide menu is going to be great um, because, you know, what works for one patient may not work for another. What might be too risky for one patient may not be a, much of a risk for another patient, um, et cetera. And so, yeah, I think I think we're moving to an era that we never had in hemophilia where we're going to have not just factor and, you know, pick which brand of factor you want, but we're going to have several different factor products with different features. Uh, we're going to have several non-factor products with different features as well, um, different modes of delivery. And then, of course, gene therapy. So it's really uh, an exciting time, but uh, it's going to be much more complex and complicated and trying to figure out who's the right patient for what is going to require us to really understand these treatments very well. And so you are all probably listening because you're trying to learn about all of these treatments as well, just as we're learning about them moving forward. And so with that, I'd like to thank you again for joining us uh, for this segment on emerging approaches for hemophilia A. Please be sure to click on the landing page for this activity to claim your AMA, ANCC, or ACPE credit, access supplemental slides, as well as other topics uh, and segments and case scenarios. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much.